Christians don't seem to be sure about how to deal with postmodernism and this spirit of inclusiveness, as Alice Bailey called it, that characterises it. It's causing a lot of confusion these days. During the modern era, where the opposition came from outright atheism, we knew where we stood with that. Atheism was an obvious antithesis to God, and we knew we didn't want anything to do with that. But in this postmodern era where spirituality is on the rise and it's all about understanding between religions to create world unity and peace, a lot of Christians are not sure how we're not meant to be part of that. Because it all sounds so noble. Peace and unity sure sound like Christian words. That sounds like something we're meant to be involved in. All around us we see rock stars, politicians and beauty queens talking about their desire for world peace above everything else and how if we work together we can achieve it. How can we not get involved in that effort? Well, there's one major barrier to unity, and it might surprise us the first time we realise what it is. The barrier to unity is truth. And the reason for this is that truth, by its very nature, is exclusive, not inclusive. Truth is a divisive thing. For example, here is a truth statement. The sky in this picture is blue. Now, by making this statement, I have automatically excluded it from being any other colour than blue. When I say what the colour of the sky is, I automatically say what it isn't. By saying it's blue, without using any words, I'm automatically saying that it isn't red, yellow, orange, brown, or any other colour. Whenever anyone makes a truth statement about anything, by implication, they automatically exclude all contrary opinions from being equally true. They draw a line in the sand and say, I believe in this, to the exclusion of all other options. So if someone were to come along and insist it was another colour, like red, there would be division between us. We would hold contrasting opinions. There would not be any unity. Now, a disagreement about the colour of the sky isn't much of a deal. But when it comes to issues surrounding God, morality, heaven, hell and eternity, we are suddenly dealing with issues which matter an awful lot. These are the things upon which human beings build their entire lives, their worldviews and their civilizations. People will readily fight and lay down their lives for their ideas of absolute truth. What a person believes about these things will guide their every thought, their every word, their every action. It forms the basis of the laws of entire nations. Therefore, while people have different beliefs about truths regarding these issues, there can never be world peace. In other words, you cannot unite the world politically or culturally or in any sense until people have the same ideas on spirituality. Spiritual unification is the key to all other kinds of unification and world peace. The UN knows this and so, because there are basically only two spiritual kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, it can only unite the world under one or the other. And we know already which it has chosen. It is going to unite the world under Satan. But the problem for them right now is that all the Babylonian religions of the world are not yet fully aware of their common root. All the various fragments of the Babylonian religion still believe they adhere to something completely different from the other religions, that theirs is true and that consequently everyone else's is wrong. To overcome this, the UN and other occultists have decided that if people's ideas of absolute truth are dividing them, then the idea of absolute truth needs to be thrown out. We have to pretend there is no such thing. As astonishing as it seems, there has been a concerted effort over the past 50 years to condition our minds into believing that there is no such thing as absolute truth. We have instead embraced the idea of relativism in the postmodern world. Alan Bloom, author of The Closing of the American Mind, wrote, There is one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student in America believes, or says he believes, that truth is relative. Bloom goes on to say, Relativism is necessary to openness, and this is the virtue, the only virtue which all primary education for the past 50 years has dedicated itself to inculcating. Openness and the relativism that makes it the only plausible stance in the face of various claims to truth and the various ways of life and kinds of human beings is the great insight of our times. Relativism expresses itself in statements like, That's true for you, but not for me. There is no right or wrong anymore. You believe what you believe, I'll believe what I believe, and we're both right. If I say that the sky is blue and someone else says the sky is red, then we're both correct. The sky may be blue for me, but that's just my truth. If the sky is red for the other guy, then that's his truth. 
This is how most people think today, that we can hold contradictory opinions and both be equally right. Now, generally speaking, this would be intellectual suicide, but we know from our study that because all false religions emanate from the same source, actually, they are all just different roads to the same hell, and in a sense, therefore, they are the same. This ecumenical movement will achieve what Satan wants it to, as they intermingle with one another and abandon their ideas of absolute truth and have interfaith dialogues, they will come to realize that they are all part of the same system and come from the same root, and there will come unity. The problem is that Christians are also being drawn into this. We too are being encouraged to believe that we don't have the truth or that we should put the truth aside for the sake of peace and unity. But the minute we abandon the absolute truth and make peace a higher goal, we have instantly moved over from God's kingdom into Satan's. We have started to mix the truth with lies, or I scream with dirt, as I put it earlier. Therefore, we can have no part in this ecumenism, this compromising, this universalism, this effort at world peacemaking, this truth abandoning. We must adhere to the knowledge that there is an absolute truth, and because we adhere to the absolute truth, we know that we are and always will be separated from the world, excluded from the world, as it attempts to rebuild Babylon on earth. Let me show you that God's word is always divided because God's word is true, and that that is a good thing. After Jesus preached in John 7.43 we read, So the crowd was divided about him. In John 10.19, after Jesus had preached, we read, When he said these things, the people were again divided in their opinion about him. Whenever the word of God, the truth, was preached, the crowds were divided. Jesus often talked about separating the wheat from the chaff, the sheep from the goats, and the good from the bad. In Matthew 10.34, Jesus says, Don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. In the Bible, the sword metaphorically represents the word of God, which is the truth. So Jesus was saying that he would bring a divisive truth that would separate. Jesus had not come to bring unity to the world. He had come to bring the truth, which some would reject and some would accept. And to those who would accept, Jesus called us out of the world, saying, If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so it hates you. We are to be divided with the world, not joined with it. Galatians 5.9 says that, Even if you were to give way on just a little bit of truth, the lie will spread like yeast through a batch of dough. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If Jesus is the truth, then the name of Jesus will always divide here on earth. Jesus came to say that if you don't have me, then you don't have God, and if you don't have God, then you're doomed to hell. You cannot be more divisive than that. It was these divisive words of truth spoken by Jesus that so riled the crowds that they crucified him. And it wasn't just Jesus. The book of Acts also reports that when the apostles preached the word of God, they caused division in the crowds too. Acts 14.4 says, after Paul had preached that, the people of the town were divided in their opinion about them. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. It was in fact said of Paul that he either caused a riot or a revival, sometimes both at the same time. Acts 17.6 is one of my favourite Bible verses and it says, Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world and now they're here disturbing our city too. People knew when godly people were around because they spoke divisive truths that ruffled feathers. The Bible says that we Christians who continue to adhere to the truth that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life will be separate from the world and that the world will hate us for it. If we speak the truth, it will do what it always has done. It will put us at odds with the world. But the Bible is clear that truth must always come before unity. Always. Where peace or unity is placed as the highest ideal in the minds of men, even above truth, we will soon find ourselves allowing false teaching, refusing to challenge heresies just to keep the peace, and even promoting it as equally valid in the name of tolerance and understanding. Unity above all is a deception. The truth has to come first, and then we unite under that truth. Jesus is the truth, so we put him first, and then unite under him and him only. We draw a line in the sand and unapologetically say, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, but as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Unity within the church is important, but we are never called to be united with the world. 
As the late Adrian Rogers once said, it is far better to be divided by truth than to be united in error. The world will find peace, but only when Jesus comes to establish his kingdom. That is, when the stone crushes the feet of the statue and his mountain covers the earth.